let people trickle in. And Joanne, if you could start recording, or oh, you have, perfect. All right. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the NOAA National MPA Center webinar series. This is a monthly series brought to you by the NOAA National MPA Center, MPA News, and the EBM Tools Network, co coordinated by Octo and NatureServ. My name is Ray Evrard. I am project manager for Octo, and we are excited to bring you Miles McMillan Lawler of Grid Arundel on finding the right 10%, assessing MPA Blue progress and the Bluebridge platform. Before we get into the webinar, let me just tell you about some of Zoom's features. At the bottom of your screen, you should see a Q&A box. Please use this to ask any questions you may have for our presenter during the webinar. Questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. If you are experiencing technical difficulties or just have a comment, please feel free to use the chat feature. And on second note, if you have any ideas for any future MPA webinars you would like to see, feel free to let us know in the chat. Now with that, let me introduce our speaker today. We have Miles McMillan Lawler of Grid Arndell, as I said before. Miles has extensive work experience in marine spatial planning, having worked with both university and government organizations prior to joining Grid Arndell in 2012. His previous work experience include developing of policy related, relating to marine spatial planning, design of marine protected area networks in Australia, and public consultation on spatial plants. His research experience includes 10 years working on marine habitat mapping and environmental assessment in Southeast Australia. Since joining Grid Arundel, he has worked on a wide range of projects, including developing a global map of sea floor geomorphology. You can find that at bluehabitats.org, development of monitoring mythology for marine habitats in Estonia, and conducting capacity building on marine spatial planning with a focus on developing countries and small island states. Miles and his team have just completed the development of the Protected Areas Impact Maps Virtual Research Environment through the Blue Bridge Project. I'll give a link to that in the chat. This cloud-based cloud tool allows rapid reporting on ecologically important features such as seamounts, canyons, seagrass, mangroves, and coral reefs represented in marine protected areas, and is focused on assisting reporting through against IACHI Target 11 and SDG 14. The links to some of the things I mentioned will be found in the chat shortly, and we are excited to have Miles with us today. So thank you, and take it away. Thank you, Ray, and thank you everyone for uh, joining this webinar. I'm, I'm quite uh, pleased to be able to present this work to, to a sort of a broad audience. Uh, so I've titled my talk today, Finding the Right 10%. It's a little bit tongue in cheek. I don't think there's actually a right 10% to have in marine protected areas, but I guess it's, it's looking at beyond just getting 10% of the area, but are we actually representing the range of features that are out in, in the marine environment? And so it's really linked straight back to assessing against the Archie Target 11, which, which I'll cover a bit later. So to start off with, I guess, you know, we, we have to look at marine spatial planning or maritime spatial planning as it's called here in Europe. And there's a big push globally to, to start planning our marine space more effectively. Uh, this is driven a lot by the blue economy with uh, new sectors like renewable energies, aquaculture and other growth areas coming on board. It's highlighted a need for the effective management of the marine space uh, to avoid conflicts and create synergies between the different activities. So um, certainly, you know, within the, the developed world, but also a lot of developing countries are really looking to marine spatial planning as a tool to both grow the blue economy sectors, but also to help conserve the, the biodiversity, the ecosystem services, that many of the, the commercial sectors rely on, and indeed the, you know, the coastal communities rely on. So this obviously then brings us to marine protected areas, which is, is one of the tools within marine spatial planning. Um, marine protected areas are essentially a tool to manage human activities. Um, so they're, they're one of the suite of, of ways we manage the human activities on the marine environment. Uh, some of the, the sort of objectives of marine protected areas are to conserve biodiversity, uh, conserve ecosystem services and cultural heritage, and this list can go on. So there are many, many uses for marine protected areas, and I guess, uh, you know, they're, they're almost as wide as there are the number of marine protected areas. And so one of the big drivers of, of the development of uh, marine protected areas currently are the global targets, like the Archie Target 11, uh, which also links into the sustainable development goals, particularly number 14, life below the water. 
And just to paraphrase some of um, Archie Target 11, by 2020, countries have committed to representing 10% of their coastal and marine areas, and especially areas of particular importance for biodiversity and ecosystem services. And I, I think this is one of the keys. At the moment, you know, we're measuring are we getting 10%, but we're not measuring are we getting 10% of what necessarily. So in this talk today, I'll present first up a framework for how we can start measuring at the global scale at least, are we getting 10% of things that are important for biodiversity and ecosystem services? And secondly, I'll go through the Bluebridge platform, uh, which actually presents a, a tool to be able to start doing this assessment rapidly. So I jumped on the, um, the protected planet today, and this is globally, we're at 7.26% uh, coverage of marine protected areas. So. Uh, you know, at the broad brush global assessment, these are the sort of numbers that we, we come up with. 7.26% of the marine environment is in marine protected areas. But do we know what it's representing? Do we know which, which ecologically important features or ecosystem services are being represented in this? We can also go down to the, the country level. So not just globally, but country level wise. I picked Gabon because they've just declared a, a quite a large marine protected area network. And I'll use them just as, as a case study uh, throughout this talk. And so we can see down the bottom of this slide that we're 28, nearly 29% of their marine area is in marine protected areas. So that's, that sounds very good. So they've, they've uh, you know, got well beyond that 10%, which is good. And I guess the next step is, well, are they representing the, the diversity of the, the different ecologically important features in their marine environment? So is achieving just the 10% enough or should it be a specific 10%? So it doesn't matter where this 10% is. And so linking back to the Archie target, we've got these, this phrase, important areas for biodiversity and for ecosystem services. And so we need to understand what that actually means in order to answer, are we getting the right 10%? And I guess this brings us to this, this idea of representative networks of MPAs, which is also within the Archie target 11. And so a representative network of MPAs is essentially a, a group of MPAs within a, a given large area that represent the range of ecologically important features within that network. And uh, once again, for Archie Target, this is, is the areas for biodiversity and ecosystem services. So to give an example of this, if we look at the uh, example of uh, the Australian Marine Protected Area Network, they had some very specific goals and then some guiding principles as to how they would do a representative network. And the first goal was to represent the range of bioregions. And so bioregions are are areas that are uh, sort of grouped together to have similar biodiversity within them based on a range of environmental uh, parameters and also species distributions. There's also depth ranges. So we know that different species occur at different depths. So this was seen as a, another important uh, part of, of uh, a representative network to represent the range of depths. Then there's also specific areas that we know have biological or ecological significance. So this might be uh, areas of the shelf break or the, the continental shelf where there's very specific biodiversity. It might be hotspots for biodiversity or presumed hotspots. And the final goal was seafloor features. So this is the geomorphology of the seafloor. So essentially classifying the shape of the seafloor and it includes features such as canyons and seamounts, uh, the shelf, the slope, the abyssal floor. And so there's a whole range of, of different ways you can divide the seafloor up based on its shape to give the, these meaningful units, which can have some reference back to biodiversity. And of course, within the Australian example, they had some principles on how to do this as well. So these, this sort of guided, and there were things such as minimise socioeconomic impact. And this really meant that you have to take into account the existing users and, and make sure you're not, not impacting those greatly. Uh, within Australia, they also called for few large reserves rather than lots of small ones. So that sort of helped, helped shape how a, a protected area network would look. Uh, and then there's also, I guess, like everywhere, there are sectoral priorities. So things like energy security, fisheries management objectives, and safety of navigation, which are all taken into account in developing marine protected areas. So if we get on to assessing the representativeness of MPAs globally, so move, moving beyond just a single country, what do we need for this? And I guess the, the first thing we need to know is where are the global marine protected areas? Um, this, is, this is sort of the important thing to feed into it. The second thing we need to know, know at the global scale are where are these features that are important for biodiversity and ecosystem services and what sort of features do we mean when we, we start looking at that? 
And the final part of it is, well, what scale are we going to do this assessment of the representativeness? And in, in our case, we're looking at um, the scale of eco-regions and EZ. So eco-regions are sort of a bioregionalization of the world at a, a sort of a reasonable scale. And EEZs are usually the unit of management that uh, a country will work on. So they develop a network of MPAs across the EEZ, uh, having that representative, but it may or may not be representative at the eco-region level. So I'll go through a little bit of this uh, through the talk to sort of highlight this issue. So for the global MPAs, um, we have the Protected Planet Initiative. Uh, this is collating all the protected areas, both marine and terrestrial globally. Uh, this is a snapshot of the, the latest protected planet data from June this year. Um, as you can see, there's some very large MPAs in the world. There's also a huge number of small MPAs in the, the marine realm. Uh, and their distribution is not even around the world. So in some areas, there's more than others. Um, some countries have obviously progressed with their marine planning and others are still in the process of doing this. Um, so this was our first input, the protected planet, marine protected areas. There's a monthly release of this data. We try and consume it um, into, into our thing as often as we can. And I'll talk a little bit about that when I get onto the Bluebridge platform. So then I guess the, the next input we have is important coastal ecosystems. And so this includes things like seagrasses, mangroves and coral reefs. And these, these coastal ecosystems and coastal habitats are known to be important for the ecosystem services they produce. They're known to be biodiversity hotspots. So they tick a lot of the Aichi Target 11 sort of uh, words. Uh, we know things like seagrasses are important nursery areas for many species. They help to provide stability to the coastline. Uh, they're also being looked at as a, a store for carbon, sequestering carbon from the atmosphere. Mangroves similarly are known to be a nursery area, an important area for some fisheries like crab fisheries. They provide a lot of stability and protect against storm surge. So they, they have a, a large role in ecosystem services. And also um, they, they help sequester carbon. So they're, they're providing quite a suite of, of different services. And similarly, coral reefs, uh, you know, then biodiversity hotspots, they provide tourism opportunities. They uh, help create sand for beaches and they provide protection from storms. So once again, they, they're ticking a lot of those boxes. And we're lucky to have uh, global coverage maps of these. The maps themselves have issues, but they are the best available data and they're constantly being worked on and improved. Uh, so this is just showing the coverage of them. As you can see, the, the coral reefs in the tropical zone, the mangroves in the, the tropical down to the, the sort of upper temperate, and then the seagrasses uh, sort of globally through the temperate regions as well as the tropical. So this is an important input data set into to any sort of global model of assessing marine protected area coverage. So the next thing is, well, what about the ecologically important features? And here we have things like um, seafloor geomorphology. So this is something we worked on at Grid Arendal back in 2012 to 2014, creating a global map of it. And essentially it's characterizing the shape of the seafloor. And so in this diagram, you can see a range of different features based on their, their shape and size and, and slope. Uh, and so we get some important ones like submarine canyons, which are known to be ecologically important. Uh, they help uh, bring up nutrient rich water from the deep up to the coastal zone. So they have some connectivity value. We also have things like sea mountains, which provide uh, hard substrate and come up into the shallow water out in the middle of the ocean. There's ridges and trenches. There's the abyssal plains. In the centre of the oceans, we have the spreading ridge areas, which are diverse areas with hydrothermal vents and a range of other biodiversity attached to them. So in all, we've got a, a whole range of different features we can map. And we also know that a lot of these features link back to biodiversity. So we know, for instance, a sea mountain will have a different suite of species to an adjacent area of abyssal plains. So already we can start using these features to, to characterise an area of seafloor. And this is the map of global sea for geomorphology produced by uh, Harris et al. in 2014. It's available on bluehabitats.org. Um, it maps 29 different features at a scale of about 10 kilometers across the global oceans. Uh, and so you can just see the distribution here and, and just looking at it, you can see there are differences in where different features occur. So for instance, around Australia and uh, New Zealand, there are quite a few plateaus in this sort of uh, khaki green color. And then in the North Pacific, there's a large number of sea mountains in, in the orange colors. 
Um, then in the middle of the oceans, you get the purple colored spreading ridges. Um, in the Arctic, you get a lot of submarine, uh, of uh, glacial troughs and, and canyons forming. So there's a, not features evenly distributed, but depending on where you're on the world, different features might be important. And I think this is important to, to recognize in looking at representative networks of marine protected areas. So the, the final part of the puzzle is, well, what are the areas of assessment we're looking at? And for areas of assessment, we've looked at, at two, and, and these are not the only ones you can look at. So first up, we've looked at exclusive economic zones. And in this case, we're taking from the coastline out to the 200 nautical miles, uh, as presented on marineregions.org as, as the, uh, the areas we're looking at. And the second one is a bioregionalization, and we've used the marine ecoregions of the world from Spalding in 2007. There are other um, layers you could use here, like large marine ecosystems, like the goods bioregions. So this is just one we've used, and certainly we advocate looking at some of the others as well. And so I guess you know, this is the, the parts of our, our global model of how you represent MPA. So you start off with an area, like an EZ or an ecoregion, and you start off with a network of marine protected areas within that region. And then you have a range of different features you want to assess. So things like seagrass, coral reefs, mangroves, the seamounts, the canyons, and all the other geomorphic features. And so by analyzing these in a, a, a spatial context, we can then look at, well, what are the area of features of each of these individual features within our EEZ or eco region? So that's sort of an inventory of, of what you've got. The next step is, well, what have you represented in your marine protected areas? So we look at the area of features within the marine protected areas. And finally, from that, you can look at the percentage of the features in marine protected areas. So are we getting 10% of all the features or are we missing some features? And so this way we can start setting conservation priorities uh, to address any gaps we have uh, and ultimately not only get 10% of the area, but also 10% of the features we see as important in a marine protected area. There are some limitations to this sort of approach. I mean, it, it's a, a, a GIS software, so spatial sort of software and expertise are needed. Um, so it's not something that everyone can do. It's not accessible unless you have that background. Also, the data we're talking about at this global scale is quite large. We're talking several gigabytes of data from different sources. So there's a real challenge in getting that data together, developing the, the models to be able to, to run that analysis. Uh, another issue is it takes a lot of time for even a powerful desktop computer to do this sort of processing. And we're talking hours to days of processing time in order to, to run this sort of analysis at the global scale. And I guess th there's another issue that if everyone goes and tries to do this, they'll all have a slightly different approach and you end up with non-comparable results. And so this sort of brings me into the second part of my talk. So that, that's sort of a framework for how you would assess representation of marine protected areas against these uh, ecologically important features and um, ecosystem services. So this brings me to the Blue Bridge project. So about three years ago, we had the opportunity to join a European collaborative project called the Blue Bridge project. Um, this was funded under the European Horizon 2020 program, uh, which is a, a source of funding for sort of research within Europe. Uh, and this one was specifically a computer infrastructure project. So we, we don't actually have a uh, sort of background in computer infrastructure, but the consortium had some uh, very strong players who dealt with computer infrastructure. And we had a very good use for this infrastructure in that we wanted to assess marine protected areas globally. So the project itself included uh, 14 partners. Uh, key ones of these were CNR, so that's the Italian National Research Institute. Uh, and they're the ones that really drove the computing infrastructure side of it. Uh, we also partnered with the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization. Um, and they, they had an interest in sort of the marine component use cases of, of this infrastructure. Of course, ourselves were involved in this and then a range of other partners. And one of the key outputs of this were things called virtual research environments. And I'll, I'll touch on what a virtual research environment is in a minute. Uh, I've just got a link here to the Blue Bridge environment itself. So this is just pr provides a bit of a description about the project, some links to the actual infrastructure, um, and then just some, some key statistics to show that this is big computing we're talking about. So, um, you know, your average computer might have, you know, a processor with, you know, four or eight cores at most. We're talking 2,348 computing cores currently in the infrastructure, 7,500 gigabytes of RAM and 370 terabytes of storage. And because it's scalable computing, they keep adding to this and, the numbers are probably much bigger now already. 
So I guess within this, this there was one side that dealt with this infrastructure, keeping these powerful computers running and, and talking. And the other side was something called a virtual research environment. And this is really a tool for the user to interact with that system and provides them with the necessary tools and, and uh, systems to be able to perform some sort of research or analysis. And so within the, in this, there's the, a web-based a web set of tools, and this can include access to data, access to algorithms to analyze that data, uh, access to the computational facilities, all seamlessly so the user doesn't have to, to worry about this. So it's quite a, an innovative way of performing analysis. And of course, because it's up in the cloud, it becomes accessible and uh, collaborative as well. And I'll talk a little bit about that as I, I show you the, the features of the virtual research environment. So the virtual research environment we developed was called the Protected Areas Impact Maps Virtual Research Environment, or PAIM for short. It's a, a mouthful of a name, but that's what it is. Um, so when you first load the Protected Areas Impact Maps Virtual Research Environment, you uh, get an interface here and it starts with a, a tutorial. So there's just a, a tutorial with videos and, and text and images that essentially show you the features of this uh, virtual research environment. Uh, I'll put an orange box up here around the top menu and this is how you navigate between the different pages. So it's a fairly standard website. Um, and you essentially you can choose the different tools. So I'll just run through what each of these features does and then really get into the nuts and bolts of the reporting side of it. So I guess our, our protected areas impact maps VRE provides the tools to accept, assess the representativeness of marine protected areas. And some of the strengths of this is it, it allows accessibility. So the data and analysis tools are available in the single environment. So the user doesn't have to hunt around for different data, set up the analysis themselves, it's all sitting there. We've also made it user friendly, so it doesn't require expert users. You don't have to have a, a GIS background to use this. It's just click on the thing you want to analyze, choose what you want to analyze and then run it. Um, because it's all cloud-based and it, it's set up in a framework, it's got a standard reporting framework. So you can compare the results across the globe, you can rerun your analysis, you can look at the differences. And the other advantage of using the cloud computing with all this huge computing be power behind it is we can speed up the analysis time. And I think instead of taking hours to days, we're talking you know, seconds to minutes for most of the analysis we do now. So it's a huge step up. And so I'll just quickly guide you through the various parts of the, the PAME virtual research environment interface. So as I said, the first bit is an interactive tutorial, just really guides the user through what the protected area impact maps VRE does, how to use it. Um, it's got some videos and, and some sort of interactive content there. So the next part is, is really the nuts and bolts part, and I'll spend a bit of the time later talking about it, which is the MPA reporting tab. And this is an interactive map uh, people can zoom in and out, turn layers on and off, and perform analysis on those layers. So I'll cover that in a minute. There's also an area for members if you're an admin and social networking. So there's actually a, a social networking feature built into the virtual research environments where people can ask questions, they can post news, they can post information, uh, they can provide feedback. If something's not working, they can let us know through there. Uh, so it's very much like sort of the, the Facebook for uh, people doing predicted area um, impact mapping. Um, and you can also see who's using it. Uh, they can share their experiences and et cetera there. The final three tabs, the data miner, the data catalog and R Studio, are really about the, the background of, of what it does. So the data miner is where you can actually run the algorithms outside the interface. And so it allows you to, to get into the nuts and bolts of the algorithms. The data catalog provides you access to all the data stored in Bluebridge. Uh, I think there's currently about 100,000 different data sets in there. Um, a lot of it from fisheries statistical background data, but there's also a lot of environmental data. There's a lot of uh, derived products from European Sentinel satellites on the currents and water quality and chlorophyll and everything. Uh, it also has functions to do species modeling. So it's quite a powerful infrastructure. And finally, there's a link to R Studio, which is a statistical language that allows you to do the analysis. And actually all the algorithms that run within the, the VRE are built using R Studio and they're openly accessible. So people could take those and modify them to their own needs. So th this is uh, back to the MPA reporting. So this is really the nuts and bolts of where things go on. 
And I'll focus again on Gabon. So I mentioned them earlier when uh, I showed off the stuff from the protected planet, which was just assessing the, the baseline coverage. And then we can start looking at, well, how well is it representing the range of features that they have within the Gabonese exclusive economic zone? And so the first part of the virtual research environment is this interactive map. Uh, it allows you to turn layers on and off. Uh, you've got the range of uh, different geomorphic features and the reefs and seagrass and mangrove layers there. You can turn them on and off. You can scroll around the map. It's fairly sort of standard interface. And you can also click on the map to choose which features you'd like to analyze for the EZs or the eco regions. And I'll show you how you switch between those in a minute. So it, it's, a, you know, it's a good way of already visually seeing are we representing things. And so if you look at the sort of the central part of the, the Gabonese um, EZ, up the top there's a marine protected area covering a canyon. So they've clearly targeted that canyon as part of their marine protected area. Um, and then there's other ones that, that aren't, aren't caught in marine protected areas. So visually you can already start seeing are they representing the range of features. And that, that's just one example with canyons. So the next part is the analysis side. And so there's a button that says query and then clicking this brings up the analysis interface. And it's fairly straightforward. You have a, a selection box where you can choose firstly, whether you want to analyze an exclusive economic zone or an eco region. And then the next one, you can choose which, which one you'd like to analyze. So you can either type in the box or click on the map to get the one you want. Then there's a range of geomorphic features you can select and the other layers, the reefs, the seagrass and the mangroves. And so you can select which ones you'd like to analyze. You can turn them all on and analyze them all. Um, the other thing here, we've got to select your own areas of interest. So if you don't want to analyze the, the global database on protected areas from Protected Planet, you can actually load in your own marine protected area network and analyze that. So this can be quite important if you're actually in the planning process. You can run iterations on different networks and see how well they represent the range of features that you're interested in. And once you're, you're happy with your, your analysis, you click run analysis, and then the algorithms will run on the, the uh, computer and or on the cloud and give you your results. Um, as I said, the results can take anywhere from a few seconds to a few minutes, depending on how complex the, the area you're looking at. Um, in this case, it's only taken 0.4 of a second to run the analysis, and this is because when you've run an analysis once it caches the data and will only rerun the analysis if something changes. So it's got some smart functions built into it. And so the first part of the analysis gives you a breakdown of firstly, the features within the, the Gabonese EZ in the blue columns uh, shows the total area. And in the green shows you the total area within marine protected areas. And then there's also a list of all the MPA showing you the contribution of each MPA to that representation. There's also the option to switch it across to percentage. And so then you'll see within the, the area, there's different percentages of features uh, protected in marine protected areas in the green columns. And so you can see all of them are above the 10%. So if, if you're assessing the Gabonese uh, MPA network against these features, you'd say they've done quite well in getting that 10%. Overall, I think there's, there's you know, nearly 28% coverage. Uh, and you can see most of the features are, are represented are close to their their level in, in uh, the EZ. So that's quite, quite interesting to see already. Um, so you can say the Gabonese have done very well in developing a representative network of marine protected areas. In clicking on each of the uh, MPAs within that list, you also get a specific report based on those MPAs. And so I've clicked on the large MPA that was covering the canyon. And you can just see here the, uh, the canyon in the background of the MPA. And it gives you a little bit of data uh, from the metadata. So it, it pulls in the metadata for that marine protected area, telling you a bit of information about it. This was developed in 2017. It's, um, you know, who, who developed it, what its classification is, et cetera, uh, and where it comes from, the, the World Database on Protected Areas. And it also then, down the bottom here, you've got a list of geomorphic features or the features that are represented in there. And in this case, we've got the canyons highlighted and it gives you the metadata for the canyons. So it's quite interactive. Um, there's also the option to save all the analysis as a PDF document and also take all the raw analysis data as a, a comma separated file if you want to take it for further analysis or to develop your own figures and graphs. So it's not just a, a, a web-based tool, but it actually allows you to take that data and share it on. So if we look at the, the Gabonese EZ, there's also two uh, eco-regions that, that cover the same sort of area. So we'll focus on the, the Gulf of Guinea South ecoregion, which covers most of the Gabonese EZ, but also comes into the neighboring countries. 
And if we rerun the analysis looking at this one, we get a slightly different answer out of it. And so first up, we get a different suite of features. So plateaus are included here that weren't found in the Gabonese EZ. And also if we look at things like the canyons, we'll see they're actually now below 10%. So at the EZ level, Gabon has done really well. But then if you go to the ecoregion level, you can see that uh, there's still some, some ground within that ecoregion if you want to get to say 10% representation of your features. And here you can see, well, for most of the features they've done okay, but certainly for the canyons and the plateaus, there probably needs to be an additional MPA in one of the neighboring countries in order to get up to that 10%. So, so you're starting to be able to use this tool to identify the priorities for, for representing at that eco-region level. And then just visually, here's a map showing that eco-region with the, the canyons and the plateaus on there. And so the plateaus in this sort of khaki color down the bottom, and you can see it comes into the, the south of that eco-region. And you can also see there's another large canyon to the south that isn't in an MPA. So somewhere within that, that range of the eco-region, it probably needs to be another canyon in the MPAs in order to get that representation of them. So I guess it, this brings me to sort of the conclusion side of my talk. Um, so I, I think here I presented both a framework and also the tools to be able to assess the progress against the RQ target 11 and help us find the right 10%. So I've just got a nice schematic here showing you know, the, the framework, the Bluebridge tool gives us the right 10%. I'd just like to acknowledge uh, the following people for the work on the Blue Ridge project uh, and, and in, indeed all, all the work to get this done. Uh, it's been quite a big team effort uh, and collaborations with, with various institutes in order to get access to data and information to help design the methodology and workflow and of course develop the cloud computing behind this. So I'd definitely like to acknowledge these people. And finally, I'd like to say thank you all for listening. Uh, I've got here the link to the Blue Ridge Predicted Areas Impact Maps VRE. Uh, and I'm happy to answer questions now. Awesome. Thank you so much, Miles. That was great. Um, to everyone listening, please remember to use the Q&A box to ask any questions now, and I'll read them out. And also, a recording of this webinar will be available on Open Channels and the NOAA MPA Center website later. But I guess I do have a question. Um, where did you get most of your data for the website from? And how often is the Bluebridge data updated? Yep, so they're very good questions. So the global geomorphology data was developed by Grid Arundale Geoscience Australia and Conservation International, and it sits on the Blue Habitats website. Uh, and so it's publicly accessible there. And so we've consumed it from that, that site. The global MPA data comes from Protected Planet. Uh, we'd love to consume it directly from there, but there are some issues with being able to analyze that data as is. So we actually work with the European Joint Research Center um, and they do some pre-processing of that data and then we consume that under sort of an agreement with the protected planet people. Um, that data, we, we try and update as frequently as possible. Probably every three months we update that, even though they do do a monthly update. But we try and especially update it if there's been changes or significant changes to the marine protected areas. Um, so that, that's that. The eco-regions come from um, the Spalding data, um, Spalding 2007, and that's available through Oceans Plus, which is a, a portal for marine data. And the seagrass, the mangroves and the coral reefs are also found there, and they're data products curated by the United Nations Environment Program World Conservation Monitoring Centre in Cambridge, the UK. Um, the EZ data comes from... Uh, the Flanders uh, Marine Regions uh, Service. And yeah, so most of those are fairly static. The Marine Regions gets updated re regularly, uh, I guess every six months or so there's a release. And so we try and keep that to the latest version. And the uh, MPAs are the other one we try and update. So they're the two dynamic layers we've got. And things like the seagrasses are, are being updated currently, I believe. So when that the new version gets released, we'll look at updating that as well. Very cool. Thank you. Um, there was a related question to mine asked by James Lord. Um, if one's MPA is not included in the data set, how can one have it added? Okay, so the, 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 I'll give you two answers here. One is you can analyze it using the platform regardless. And the second is you need to contact Protected Planet, which is protectedplanet.org, and they have a link there to, to help you get in contact with them and get your data on board with that. And I think that's a very important thing for everyone to do. So we can actually 
start assessing the status of, of MPAs globally. And really, you know, I, I, I was in West Africa recently and everyone was bemoaning that their data wasn't seen on that, that service, but actually it wasn't seen because no one had provided it. So it, it's sort of a, a, you know, it can only, only show what it shows. Cool. Cool. Thank you. Um, ben Best is asking, is the development of mapping interfaces and reporting methods available to others? How is the mapper interface constructed since RStudio is just a code editor, but Shiny is a web application framework, although only the library? So you just leave that for mapping, sorry. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So the, firstly, the, the BlueBridge platform, um, Protected Areas Impact Map uh, Virtual Research Environment is open to, to all. So you can register for free and use it and analyze it. In terms of how it was built, uh, it was built using Leaflet for the mapping interface. Uh, the R code was uh, developed to actually do the spatial analysis. The, you can download that. It's actually available on the, the Bluebridge platform to, to access that code. You can download it. You can run it on your own computer in R. Um, the mapping interface, I'm not sure if you can actually download it directly from there, but we'd be more than happy to share it if you want it. So you can just comment on the, the Bluebridge platform that you'd like to to access or have, have some of that, and we'll get one of our guys to contact you and work out what exactly to do. Okay, cool. So is it um, open source, just to clarify, the Bluebridge platform? Yes. Yep, yes. Yep. So the, the, the platform is built on open source technology. All our scripts, so the, the R code to do the analysis is all open and accessible. Um, there, there is a GitHub, I think, for it somewhere. So. So my, most of it is open and accessible, and I can put details of that up on the Bluebridge platform if people are interested. Yes, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, the next question by Mauricio Romero. Um, in the database, is included biophysical dispersal modeling? If yes, what type of model? The, the answer is, is no. In our virtual research environment, it's not. However, in the Bluebridge platform, it, it has the capacity to do that. Um, I'm not sure if it's been enacted, but there's a lot of ecological modeling that's been done in the platform. And there, there's something called the, the biodiversity lab, which has uh, a lot of algorithms for, for biodiversity modeling. And I think there might even be some dispersal modeling in that. So there's the option. And I, I guess we're looking at what's after Bluebridge. And this is one of the things we're very interested in is bringing in uh, various ecological modeling and, and dispersal modeling into these sort of platforms and also projections of climate change and how things will look in the future so that when you're planning marine protected areas, you can start taking these things into account as well. Okay, cool. Um, Dustin Colson leaning is asking, uh, is there data on the type of protections, extractive industries, commercial fishing, et cetera, provided within different MPAs to ensure that our MPAs are doing an adequate job in protecting the ocean's biodiversity? Yeah, so the, the global database sometimes has some of that information, not always. Um, and this is one of the challenges with using it, that it's it's built on the data submitted by countries as, as their official data for marine protected areas. So in some cases, it's very detailed and you can get to that. In other cases, it's not. So it's a real challenge sometimes to, to get to that next level of analysis. Are, are these, you know, which features are they protecting if they're benthic or pelagic? Um, you know, and I guess I haven't touched at all on in this talk on actually are the MPAs effective. I've really still looked at the, the footprint of them. You know, what's within them? It does doesn't say anything about how well they're actually protecting uh, or conserving those features. But at least as a start, they're within in a protected area of sorts. So that that's a good starting point. Um, but certainly, there's, there's there's still a big body of work to get to that next level of being able to say, well, which ones prevent bottom fishing? Which ones prevent one activity mm -hmm. or the other at the global scale. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah. So can data be added from like their own features, like burrowed mud or rocky reefs, those sort of things? Can Not currently. We, do, we don't have a feature to update your own data. And this is in this, the, the, the sort of the next phase is something we'd really love to do is, is take the algorithms we've got, which are sort of hardwired for these global data sets and make them able to take in anyone's data set. So you essentially get that um, cloud computing power to analyze you know, specific data sets for maybe your country or region that don't have that global coverage, but are very important for a particular area. So it's certainly something we're looking at how to get the funding to do that next round. Okay, cool. 
Um, Christine Franklin is interested in knowing if you ever be interested in incorporating data on animals, for example, threatening dangerous species, lane habit, or transit through the MPAs. Yes, the, the, this is, is really high on our agenda and, and one of the other partners in the Bluebridge platform has been doing a lot of work on, on the species distributions and taking the, the point data and converting it into the distribution data, looking at how those distributions might change under under different climate scenarios. I think they did some modelling of the, the puffer fish coming into the Mediterranean and where that might end up in 20, 50 years' time. And I think this is really important for uh, protected area planning is understanding not only the, the seafloor features and habitats, but species that occur there both now and under different climate scenarios. Um, so I think this is a, a really important sort of next step. And I guess because this first project was about building the framework and the next one's about expanding it further to meet the community's needs. All right, cool, thank you. Um, well, those are the questions we have now. I'll just ask one more question to, and wait to see if other people ask. Uh, where would you sort of like to see Bluebridge go in the future? What would you like to see it incorporate more of? Um, I, I think definitely for me, the, the species stuff is, is probably one of the keys, uh, being able to inc incorporate um, some of the, the, you know, the OBIS data essentially into the platform would be fantastic. And that all already sits in Bluebridge, but we don't have it within our analysis platform. So that's something we'd love to do. Uh, we ran out of time in this current phase, but I, I think in, in the next phase, that's one of the priorities. And the, the second one is really making it so it can be, it can be country specific as well. So we focus really on a global model at the moment. Um, being able to analyse global MPAs, but certainly at, at the country level, they'll often have better data on seagrasses or on specific habitats like rocky reefs that aren't available at global data sets. So being able to have a way of getting that data into the, into the analysis platform and analyse quickly, I think would be a, a huge step forward. Um, we're always uh, welcoming feedback from the, the user community. So you can use the, uh, the social network chat function suggest changes, uh, suggest new features. We, we always welcome that. And we're also very happy to look at collaborations as well. So if you, if you think there's something you can offer, please let us know because we're always open to, to collaborations. Great, well, I do see one person here who really would like to collaborate you. So I think yep. you'll be getting some emails. <laughs> yep, no, fantastic, Ben, I can see that. <laughs> awesome. Um, and that said, if anyone else has any further questions they think of later, please feel free to email Miles or email us and we'll pass it along. Uh, but until then, uh, we would like to thank you, Miles, for coming up here and doing this webinar. It was great to have you on. And uh, a recording will be available on Open Channels and the MPA Center News but uh, yeah. soon. So thank you, Miles. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. And thank you, everyone, for, for participating in this webinar. All right. Cool. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye.